And good morning all and welcome to the Southern Africa Food Security Outlook Briefing. In this briefing, we'll be covering the June 2024 to January 2025 period. And as Jenna mentioned, I'm Beth Week, Senior Food Security Analyst here at FuseNet and will be joined by Laura Levins, a Food Security Analyst at, also at FuseNet. And she'll be presenting a little later on in the presentation, diving into our area of concern, DRC. So first, taking a look at what we'll be covering in today's briefing, we'll go over our key messages, we'll do a regional overview, and then a deep dive into our areas of concern, the DRC and Zimbabwe. And before doing that, I'd like to just situate ourselves in a season in the seasonal calendar for a typical year for southern africa just so we have an understanding of what typically happens in climatology as well as how households access key food and income sources during the outlook period so in june where our current situation is situated this is when the main harvest is finishing up and then is as we get into northern hemisphere summer we start to see the second season harvest ongoing in Mozambique, vegetable guard, gardening peaking across the region, as well as the wheat harvest in Southern Africa and Zimbabwe. Now in September, as we head into Northern Hemisphere fall, This is when we rainy season where, sorry, really, okay, sorry, I had a little internet, internet connection disruption. So in October, we see the start of the main rainy season, which will continue through the end of our projection period. The lean season also coincides with the rainy season. Also during this time, the peak agricultural labor demand period is ongoing and we see the winter wheat harvests wrapping up in Malawi and South Africa. And it's also important to note that seasonality is somewhat different in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Laura will cover that in later on in the briefing. But generally we what we see in DRC and what is important for food household food access is the cassava harvest which is ongoing throughout the projection period so now taking a look at our key messages for the briefing the widespread negative impacts of severe drought conflict and weak and unstable economies are expected to drive and expand crisis ipc phase three outcomes through january 2025 the areas of greatest concern are deficit producing areas of Zimbabwe, Eastern DRC, Southern Malawi, and areas of Mozambique. While outside of the projection period, needs are expected to peak between the January to March 2025 period, where over 30 million people are expected to be in need of food assistance. Now, the historical dry spell coupled with the above, above average temperatures that we saw in early 2024 during the 2023-2024 rainy season, which was, is an important period for crop development in Southern Africa, significantly impacted crop development and led to well below average maize harvests across the region. This has resulted in generally low and tight market supply and market supply is expected to remain low and and decrease throughout the projection period overall poor households are expected to have below average purchasing capacity <laughs> purchasing capacity associated with households earning below average income amid the very high prices we're expected to see across the region now i take a look at our current situation across the region. Now, first, before diving into what we're seeing in June 2024, I'd like us to take a couple steps backward and look at what has happened in previous seasons in Southern Africa, as well as the past 2023-2024 rainy season. Now, many areas across Southern Africa have faced six or more below average seasons in the last six years, and this is over 50 percent of, of of seeing below average poor rainy seasons or production 
in the last 10 years. This map, which is shown on the right, is showing the number of below average seasons per the Water Requirement Satisfaction Index. And this index is used to show the availability of water for maize to grow during an agricultural season. And generally we see the yellow to dark red colors across most of the region. And now the areas I'd like to point your attention to are areas that are circled here, where, which is Southern Malawi, much of Zimbabwe and Southern Mozambique. Now in these areas, we've seen consistently low, below average WRSI corresponding with below average production. And I'd also like to point out that this map does not indicate associate poor seasons from heavy rainfall or from tropical cyclones. So for in southern Malawi, where we saw negative impacts from tropical cyclone Fred, Freddie, this is not necessarily considered in this map, where we have, it is perhaps possible that we've seen more below average seasons than what is being shown here. So taking a look at the cumulative rainfall deficits for the 2023-2024 season as a percent of average, as shown here by the map on the left. Now we're seeing largely yellow to dark red colors across much of the region. However, these are moderate to somewhat severe rainfall deficits, but don't really show the severity of what we saw in terms of rainfall and its impacts on crop production. So what we saw in this cropping season is poor rainfall during the late January to March period, which is a key time for crop development. And so looking to the graphs on the right, where we see the five-day rainfall totals for the entire season in Matabalalana North, Zimbabwe on the top, and Gaza, Mozambique on the bottom, we can see that compared to the average, which is in the green line, the 2023-2024 period, so February to March 2024, was notably poor in these areas. And now when we look at the scale of what we saw in terms of poor rainfall during this period, this map is highlighting that much of Central Southern Africa saw a very poor or historically poor January to March period, as shown here by the yellow to dark red colors. And this had significant impacts on crop production. So now looking at the impacts of this rainfall on crop production. The map on the left is showing the end of season maize conditions as of June 2024, according to GeoGlam. Now across many areas of the region, you can see these orange to dark red colors. The orange is indicating poor conditions where it is estimated that production is 10 to 25% below average. And failure in this map means that production is 25% or more below average. We can see in Zimbabwe, pro surplus producing areas of Zambia as well as Southern Malawi, we see widespread failure as well as poor conditions in central Malawi, most of Mozambique, areas of Angola, as well as the areas of the Maze Triangle of South Africa and Lesotho. Now looking to this, to the map on the right, which is showing vegeta vegetation conditions as a percent of average for late June, early July. This, now the poor rainfall has also is associated with widespread and poor vegetation conditions across the region, which is shown here in the yellow to dark brown colors. And, and this is notable in areas where we saw poor rainfall. Now many surface, surface water sources are already dry in the start of July and September following the poor regeneration of water and pasture conditions during the rainy season. And while livestock are not a key food and income source in the region, Livestock conditions are deteriorating and households are engaging in distress sales amid this poor vegetation conditions. So 
So looking at FuseNet's production estimates, which were made in April for 2024 production, I would also like to note that FuseNet is currently working on updating its supply and market outlook, which will be available in the coming weeks and provide more detail, more detailed estimates on our 2024 production. So overall domestic production across much of the region was below average. Besides in Angola and Madagascar, where production estimates were near average. The production deficits were most severe in Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Mozambique and Malawi, where we saw production ranging from 20 to 60% of the five-year average in these areas. So looking to the graph on the left, which is showing the regional May supply estimates for 2023-2024 in the center, 2024-2025 on the left, compared to the five-year average, which is on the left, sorry, 2024-2025 is on the right. Now, overall for this marking year, which is 2024-2025, regional market supply is expected to be tight due to that low production. Now, South Africa, which is typically a significant surplus producing country in the region, was only able to produce a small surfeit surplus sufficient to meet the import needs of Botswana, Lesotho, Namibia, and Eswatini, but will not be able to provide enough maize to cater for the total regional demand. And FUSA estimates that at least an additional 3 million tons of imported maize is necessary for the region. May, now, market supply for maize for small grains, pulses, and tubers from the 2023-2024 harvest is generally below average for most countries, with the exception of DRC, with no to significantly below average supplies in most areas, most in areas most impacted by the drought, like in Zimbabwe, which is keeping food prices in most markets higher than last year and the five-year average. So now taking a look at our regional maize price trends. So the map on the left is showing maize prices in June 2024 compared to the same time last year. In countries such as Mozambique, Malawi, and areas of Southern Madagascar, we can see that prices are generally above average. This is amid the tight supply in the region. Overall, we do see that prices are somewhat mixed in the DRC due to some of the dynamics, and Laura will touch on that later on in the briefing. Now, typically at this time of year, we do see a decline in maize prices, as you can see by the charts on the right, which are showing the maize price trends in Maputo, Mozambique on the top and in Sanje, Malawi on the bottom. However, this year, we in some areas, we did see some declines in prices. However, prices do remain well above average, as you can see by both here, the graphs on price trends. So taking a look at the overall macroeconomic conditions in the region, inflation remains high in Angola, Zimbabwe, and Malawi. The Angolan inflation rate is elevated due to the currency devaluation in June 2023 and the reduction in fuel subsidies. In Zimbabwe, inflation has been high for a number of years. However, we did see inflation ease in April since the introduction of the new currency in the country. And inflation in Malawi remains elevated is, and driven by the continued high prices within the country. Across most other countries in Southern Africa, we see generally inflation rates lower than 10%. So taking a look at conflict in Capo Delgado, Mozambique, and this is a key driver of acute food insecurity in this area. And while conflict is also a key driver of acute food insecurity in DRC, Laura will be touching on that later on in the briefing in a bit more detail, so I won't be covering it here. So in, in Capo Delgado, that we saw a resurgence of previously of, of conflict in previously affected areas, which has negatively impact previously displaced and newly displaced populations. Attacks in early 2024 were particularly concerning because they occurred during the peak of the 2023 
2024 rainy season, where numerous numbers of populations, including displaced and returnees, were engaged in own production agriculture activities. Now, due to the attacks and the fear of further violence, people fled their farms and sought safety. And this in turn led to more households relying on humanitarian food assistance. Now, because of the, not only were agriculture activities severely impacted, we've also seen negative impacts on households' ability to earn income generally. And overall income is below average and which is impacting households' ability to purchase food. Additionally, Increase in security and the limited response and limited funding for response are causing some issues for food aid distribution in the region. It is important to know, though, note though that outside conflict affected areas of Capo Delgado production was favorable and households are able to access food from their own production. So now taking a look at our key assumptions for our outlook period. So these maps are showing what is the maize production status, which is shown in the colors on the country. And then we're looking at trade flows, which is shown by the arrows. Now the map on the left is looking at our typical maize production status and trade flows we see in the region. Generally, green is showing us a typical surplus producing country, yellow is a self-sufficient country, and deficit producing countries are in orange. Typically, we see significant surpluses from South Africa, Zambia, and Tanzania, which are then exported to deficit and also self-sufficiency countries to help prop up market supply in the, these countries. Now, what happened this year in our expected production stat project, project stat production status and our production maize and our projected maize flows for the 2024-2025 marketing year are a bit different. This is notably because we have seen because this of the self-sufficiency status that we're seeing in South Africa and the large deficits, which you can see across many countries in brown on the map on the right. So while intra-regional trade will soften national trade de the national deficits in Southern Africa, we will, it will not be able to meet regional needs. And at least 3 million metric tons of imports are expected, are expected to be needed from outside the region to meet the regional maize demand. While there are, have been some notable slowdowns at the port of Durban, resulting in increased cargo traffic around the Cape of Good Hope, there is no indication that the port congestion will impact our regional, the regional impact, import capacity. Now, an important trader in the region is Zambia, and Zambia imposed an export ban in February 2024, responding to signals of a supply deficit. And this is expected to result in some constriction, is expected to contribute to the overall restriction in May supply in the region. Additionally, Zimbabwe and Mozambique are have heavily reached out to the South African government in an effort to fill their deficits through maize grain from South Africa. Now, this has limited South Africa's ability to export to countries such as Botswana, Namibia, Lesotho, and Eswatini, as it typically does. Overall, it is expected that regional maize supply will remain constricted across the projection period and for the marketing year. Now, looking at our other key assumptions for the production period, food and income sources, and this map on food and income sources. This graph on the right is showing food and income sources for livelihood zone number 12, which is in Malawi. And we're seeing that poor and very poor households typically rely on a basket of food and income from their own sources, such as crops and, cro and selling of crops as well as gifts 
and remittances, labor, self-employment, activities, small business, as well as wild foods. Overall, the most of these food and income sources are expected to remain constrained during the entire projection period. Poor households are expected to continue to pursue new or expand typical income earn, earn, earning opportunities in an effort to earn more cash for food purchases. However, due to the high prices that are expected in the region, household purchasing capacity is expected to remain below average. A normal start to the 2024-2025 rainy season is expected. However, due to low liquidity and the lack in payment power, this will result in below normal labor during land preparation and planting periods. Many households are likely to continue engaging in negative coping strategies to minimize food consumption gaps amid the high staple food prices. And while outside of our projection period, improvements in food security outcomes are not expected until the harvest in April of May, 2025. So taking a closer look at the start of the 2024-2025 season, so taking a look at the graph here on the left, which is showing the ENSO forecast probabilities based on conditions we saw in July 2024. The blue bars are showing the probability of La Nina. The gray bar is showing the probability of ENSO neutral conditions. And the red bar is showing the probability of El Nino conditions. We can see an increasing probability from summer in to fall for the Northern Hemisphere of La Nina emerging during this time. Now, due to the close relationship in the ENSO phase to rainfall in Southern Africa, it is expected that with La Nina, generally we see above average rainfall in the region. So taking a look at a forecast model from NOAA, which is shown here on the right, we can see that the precipit we expect that there are increased chances of above average rainfall across much of the region. As you can see denoted here in the little green dots that you see denoted across many areas. So now taking a look at our projected food security outcomes for the projection period. So taking a look first at the June to September period, Crisis is expected to be widespread across many er areas, primarily driven by drought, as well as conflict, specifically in northern Mozambique, as well as DRC. In June to September, as households have limited household food stocks and they've exhausted these food stocks atypically early, we are expected to see them become increasingly market dependent amid below average purchasing power. Now, in many areas, we do expect, expect stressed outcomes, specifically in some areas of surplus producing Zimbabwe, areas of central Mozambique, as well as southern Madagascar. Now, while production was below average in these areas, households have some food stocks for to access food and will be consuming own food stocks during this time. However, they will have below purchasing power to meet their non-food needs. Now, as we head into the October to January 2025 period, crisis outcomes are expected to expand in many areas of the region. This is due to the fact that increased market demand will drive higher prices and households will continue to have below average purchasing capacity. Now, food assistance is expected to mitigate that deterioration in acute food security in areas of Madagascar and in some areas of the northern region of Mozambique. However, overall, the share of the population experiencing crisis outcomes in southern Africa is expected to increase significantly during the October to January period. But I'd like to take a look, a look quickly at the regional food assistance needs. First, looking at our needs with DRC. So now this is a graph looking at our historical trends in FUSENET's annual peak population in need 
for from 2016 to 2024. I'd like to note that in 2024, we started per started including covering not just Eastern DRC, but all of DRC. So one of the reasons that we're seeing such an increase in our need in the peak population need is because of our increased coverage of DRC. However, overall, we are seeing an increase in the population in need across the region. And so quickly taking a look at needs when we take out DRC, we can see that peak needs in 2025 are still expected to be higher than we saw following the 2015-16 drought, 2019-2020 drought, or the 2018-2019 drought, and the 2019-2020 drought when needs were very high. And overall, the increase in needs are driven by high needs in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Malawi. So just to take a peek at a, a particular events that FuseNet monitor is monitoring during our outlook period that could change our scenario. These are events that could occur and would increase our population in need or result in more severe outcomes across the region. Now, as the rainy season occurs during the second second half of the projection period, disturbance to, disturbances to that rainy season, including a late start, a prolonged dry spell, or, pre, or poor rainfall, at some, at, especially during the key time for crop development, this would have impacts on, negative impacts on FuseNet's projections. Additionally, a tropical cyclone occurring during the rainy season, especially during the key crop development stages in early 2025, would also have negative impacts on our projections. So now taking a closer look at Zimbabwe, one of FuseNet's areas of highest concern. So looking at historical production. So this is a chart showing domestic maize production by season from 2013 to 2024. Now the bars are showing that year's production and the blue line is showing the 10 year average. As discussed before, the delayed start to the rainy season, a, historically, a historical dry period during critical time for crop growth and grain filling stages resulted in significantly below average harvest. The Ministry of Agriculture estimates that a production in 2024 is around 60% lower than the 10 year average, which you can see here. It is also important to note that production is no similar to that of what we saw in 2016, and, but, and lower than the, what we saw in 2019 and 2020. In April, the Ministry of Agriculture reported that 42 of 60 rural districts in the country had zero to three months cereal self-sufficiency for the 2024-2025 consumption year, which means that by July and August, most households will be relying on market purchases to meet their food needs until the next harvest is expected, which is in March and April of 2025. Additionally, the water and pasture conditions are deteriorating quickly, especially in the semi-arid areas, which are among the worst affected areas in the country. In some areas, as you can see here by the picture on the left, you can see the generally poor pasture conditions, as well as the poor livestock conditions, as you can denote by the ribs in this cattle in this cow shown here in some areas livestock are already trekking long distance to water points or relying on boreholes and sand scoop water holes along dry riverbeds for water and similar to maize availability the ministry of agriculture estimated that there was only zero to three months of availability of for livestock drinking water and pastures across much of the country. And this is what you can see here by the vegetation condition shown as a percent of average in mid-July, where we generally see widespread orange and brown colors, which are showing overall very poor pasture or vegetation conditions across the country. 
Now taking a look at water access. Water access and availability are below normal across most parts of the country. Surface water sources such as streams and rivers are dry, especially in typical semi-arid areas, as you can see here by the picture on the left, which was taken in May of 2024. Riverbed sand scooping for water is occurring substantially earlier than normal due to the lack of available surface water, and boreholes are currently the main source of water for domestic livestock and, li and other livelihood uses. Now, taking a look at the Karibo Reservoir by this graph here that's shown at the right, which is a critical water source that also generates electricity, particularly for Zimbabwe and Zambia. So the minimum operating level, which is showing the, is in the line, dashed line at the bottom, and then at 2024, 20, 2023, 2024 level shown by the blue line, we can see that we're near his, historically low levels for this time of year. So the Kariba Dam is only around 11% full and close to minimum operating levels of 475.5 meters as of late July due to the poor recharge of water sources because of the poor rainy season. More frequent and extended power cuts, including rolling blackouts, will likely affect industry industrial and general economic activity and likely contribute to the reduction in household income generating opportunities. So taking a look at some of the economics and the drivers of high food prices in Zimbabwe. So annual headline inflation has declined in recent months due to stability in the domestic currency which you can see here by the graph on the left and the which is and the annual headline inflation is shown in blue here. Now, however, though, while we have seen this decline, key informants and independent sources indicate that inflation is actually much higher than what is being reported officially. And, what, and you can see here the trend in annual food inflation. However, that was increasing until the adoption of the ZIG, the new local currency in April. However, updated data on, the, on annual food inflation has not been available since then. So looking to May's price trends across the country, which is part of the driver of the high inflation in Zimbabwe. Now, part and part of the contribution of the high food prices is that the staple grain mark um, staple grains on the markets are significantly below our supply is significantly below normal, and household demand is high. Now, maize and small grain retails for 9 to 12 USD per 17.5 kg bucket across much of the country, which is compared to a 3 to 5 US dollar price per bucket, which we typically see after a good season. Now, generally, USD prices for basic food and services and commodities have, are remaining stable, but they're very high and unaffordable for most poor households. And the prices in USD are important because this is how most households earn food and or earn their income and then in turn purchase food in USD prices. So looking forward through our assumptions for Zimbabwe. Now, taking a look on the right here, which is our seasonal calendar for a typical year, we can see that generally land preparation and other agriculture activities really start happening towards the later part of our projection period, as this is the typical dry period. And households during the current period will engage in activities such as crop sales, non-agricultural casual labor, self-employment activity, access remittances, sell livestock, and as well barter and engage in crafts. However, income from these sources will remain below average. 
amid the continued expectation of high prices throughout the outlook period. As a result, household purchasing capacities, notably for those poor households, will remain below average due to the low income and anticipated high prices. Households are expected to expand income earning acti activities, but the increased competition will negatively impact their earning potential. So taking a look at our projected food security outcomes for Zimbabwe, in the June to September period, Fusan expects crisis outcomes to be widespread, notably in deficit producing areas of the country. Now in some surplus producing areas where production was below average, however, because it is typically surplus producing, households do have some access to maize from their own production and are consuming their own foods. However, they still face difficulty accessing their non-food needs. During this period, we are seeing households engage in consumption-based coping atypically early for, for this time of year. Now taking a look as we head into late 2024, early 2025, where we expect crisis outcomes to expand to the entire country of Zimbabwe. This is due to the very high prices that are expected in the country and the low income earning among poor households. In areas where crisis outcomes are persisting throughout the June to January period, we do expect the share of the population in crisis to increase during this time. Now I will hand it over to Laura for the Area of Concern, Democratic Republic of Congo. All right, thank you, Beth. Uh, turning now to our second area of concern, DRC. So as Beth alluded to earlier, the food security context in DRC is quite different than the rest of the region. And that's not just due to the protracted conflict that's been ongoing, but also by fundamental differences in climatology and the timing of the agricultural calendar. So although chronic poverty is widespread in DRC, exacerbated by structural factors such as weak infrastructure and services, levels of acute food insecurity are typically low in much of DRC in the absence of a severe shock. Uh, and that's due to its favorable climate and abundant regular rainfall. So as shown here by our seasonal calendar, there are two agricultural seasons each year with harvests occurring around January and June in most of the country, except in Southeast DRC. And as Beth mentioned, cassava is harvested year round across the country. Um, also important to note that fishing and foraging are also key components of livelihood systems across DRC, both for consumption and sale. So looking at the calendar here in June, the start of our projection period, the season one harvest has just begun in the bimodal two season areas of DRC. And the annual harvest is just wrapping up in these Southern unimodal areas. So besides conflict, DRC faces other cumulative shocks, including natural disasters, seasonal flooding, and macroeconomic instability. So as we see on the calendar, flooding typically peaks between April and May and October to November in bimodal zones and January in the Southeast. Uh, it's important to note that the last two seasons in DRC have seen excessive rainfall, causing historic flooding, landslides, and the destruction of infrastructure and household assets. Uh, the worst flooding occurred mostly in the Congo River Basin and along Lake Tanganyika, with the Congo River reaching its highest levels in 60 years. Uh, DRC also faces macroeconomic challenges, which have led to the continued depreciation of the Congolese franc and high inflation rates, especially for food and fuel. Uh, next slide. So conflict remains the main driver of acute food insecurity in DRC um, with the greatest intensity in the Northeast. So uh, clashes between the M23 rebels and the government forces known as the FARDC, supported by various militias continue in North Kivu province, which you can see in the map on the right. Uh, it's kind of towards like the central bottom area of the map. Uh, M23 recently expanded territorial control into Kalehe in South Kivu, also shown on the map. And concurrently, the Allied Democratic Forces, the ADF, have continued to launch attacks in parts of Ituri and North Kivu. Ongoing conflict continues to drive 
forced population displacements and disrupt livelihoods across the, the country. IDPs tend to face more significant challenges accessing food and income, especially those who have been newly displaced. So in areas hosting the largest numbers of IDPs, there's a lot of heightened competition for already limited employment opportunities, which further challenges both IDP and host households' abilities to meet their basic needs. Um, so again, the figure on the right here, we can see our areas of highest concern within Eastern DRC, where the conflict levels are the most intense. So this would be notably Jugu in Ituri province, Kalehe, as I mentioned, in South Kivu, and Masisi, Lubero, and Rutshuru also in North Kivu province. Next slide. So as of June 2024, according to OCHA, there were over 7 million IDPs in DRC. So the figure here on the left shows kind of the general geographic distribution of IDPs across DRC. And the orange circles are representing IDPs, internally displaced persons, and the blue circles are refu representing the refugee populations. And the size of that circle is directly proportional to the number of displaced persons. So as we can see, Eastern DRC also hosts the vast majority of IDPs with over six and a half million living in Ituri, North Kivu and South Kivu provinces alone. Um, there's some other localized conflicts in DRC, such as those in Tanganyika and Mayandombe in the West, and those have also forcibly displaced local populations. And as we can see as well, Northern DRC hosts the most significant refugee populations, and these populations are mostly coming from the Central African Republic and the Sudans. Next slide. So the poor macro economy has also been exacerbating acute food insecurity. The Congolese franc has depreciated significantly since last year. As of June, it depreciated almost 20% against the US dollar. Uh, accordingly, inflation has remained high, uh, exacerbated by this currency depreciation, as well as food and fuel price increases. According to the central bank, annualized inflation as of June 2024 was nearly 16%, uh, or 15.3%, excuse me, um, with most inflation, about 70% of that, attributable to increases in food prices. Such high inflation across DRC is challenging already generally limited household purchasing capacities, uh, and inflation has tended to be the most pronounced in conflict-affected areas where household incomes have taken the biggest hit. Um, staple food prices have remained well above five-year averages and continue to increase, despite some a little bit of lifting of some of that inflationary pressure compared to last year. Um, so the figure on the right shows observed and projected prices of maize flour, a key staple food in DRC. Uh, this is for Goma, which is a key reference market in the East. Uh, so we can see that prices are currently seasonally low given the recent harvest, but they're still around 25% higher than the five-year average and are expected to remain well above that average through 2025. Next slide. So now I'll lay out the key assumptions underpinning our June outlook projections. First of all, ongoing deep conflicts are expected to persist throughout the scenario period with maximum intensity in the Northeast. Attacks are going to continue to displace households and severely disrupt their access to fields and livelihoods. Food prices, as I mentioned, are expected to remain higher than last year and above the five-year average across most of the country due to inflationary pressures. Uh, the recent El Nino-induced drought that Beth had talked about in detail, that was also experienced in Southeast DRC, notably in Katanga and Kasai, um, as well as, of course, several neighboring countries during the last growing season, and not significantly reduced agricultural production, particularly for cereals. However, the, the Congolese government is procuring lots of maize from Tanzania, and that's expected to help with most of the deficit. Uh, seasonal natural disasters, uh, including floods and landslides, are likely to impact household livelihoods in the most flood-prone areas during the rainy season from September to January. And finally, in areas that have been most impacted by the compounding shocks of conflict and floods, household access to foraged foods is expected to be below average. Next slide. So while we, we don't anticipate significant significant mapping changes uh, across the periods due to protracted and repeated conflict and flooding shocks throughout the projection period, 
We do expect the number of people in need to increase between the projection periods uh, slightly from around 14 million between June and September, uh, and then to around 14.9 million during that October to January period, which also coincides with the peak of the season one lean season. We would anticipate that in the absence of humanitarian assistance, around 10% of that pin would face emergency outcomes while the rest would face crisis. Uh, next slide. So in our areas of concern, area level crisis outcomes are expected through January, 2025 in the areas that have been most intensely affected by ongoing conflict in North Kivu, South Kivu, Ituri, and also Mayan Dombe province in the West. Below average June and January harvests are likely to only bring about a marginal improvement in food availability and household stocks from own production or in-kind payments for agricultural labor are going to be quickly exhausted. Displaced households who have not had secure access to land for their own production or secure access to forested areas for gathering wild foods are going to need to turn to the market for their food supplies much earlier than normal, facing significantly above average prices with below average incomes. Uh, market and supply disruptions due to the ongoing conflict are going to continue to exert further upward pressure on the prices of essential items. Many households will be forced to turn to selling assets to meet their minimum calorie needs or will have to reduce meal portions and frequency. A small proportion of the population in these zones, uh, we're expecting them to face emergency uh, outcomes. Mostly these are recently displaced households or those in the most insecure areas whose livelihoods have been eroded by repeated displacements uh, in the last few years. And these populations will likely have to resort to more extreme measures such as begging to earn money to for food purchases. Uh, next slide. Uh, and that's just showing my Ndobe, um province on the left. Uh, that's Kwamuth, uh, where localized conflict is high. So in the central basin areas encircled here, uh, notably Ecuador province, uh, repeated flood related natural disasters have eroded households livelihoods and capacities to cope with additional shocks. Um, seasonal flooding during the upcoming August to January rainy season is expected to drive stressed outcomes in the most flood prone areas through January, 2025. In the territories that suffered major flooding in April and May in Ecuador province, crisis outcomes are expected due to the ongoing recovery from this severe flooding. However, outside of the areas that have been affected by flooding or conflict, most households are expected to be able to meet their basic food needs with the arrival of the June and January harvests but are likely to struggle to meet their non-food needs due to high prices and limited income generating opportunities. Uh, this would be most pronounced in areas that are hosting significant refugee populations in the North, um, including North Ubangi and Odulele. Um, and those, yeah, that's just showing those areas up North. Uh, and with that, we will stop the recording and open it up to questions. Thank you very much.